All right, so hello everybody. It is now um, time to lecture on the second part. Now, I just wanna uh, say that future lectures are not this long. Typically I'll upload one 35, 40 minute lecture per week. But because I like to introduce you all to the roots, the foundation um, of the United States Constitution, it adds a little bit. So don't feel like every week I'm gonna give you like a thousand hours worth of lectures. <laughs> I promise I'm not that type of professor. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with y'all so we can go ahead and dive back in to this wonderful world of constitutional rights. So in the first part of this lecture, I explored with you all the foundation, the motivation for entering into the United States Constitution, which again, wasn't even a twinkle in their eye. They still were moving forward as if they would have a new king, a monarchy, right? Um, it wasn't until they decided to revamp the United, or the, um, the Articles of Confederation that they decided, look, we need a document with some teeth and with some more structure, democracy and power and limitations on the bigger government, but powers to the people. So moving forward, just know that they wanted limitations on the government, powers to the people, right? So the exact opposite of a monarchy. Now remember, they would not have ever even gotten the United States Constitution in its original form approved had they not gotten the 13 delegates to get the approval of the people to ratify it with the promise that they would come back three years later and include a Bill of Rights, which as you can see, they did in 1791. So the original Bill of Rights only applied to acts of the federal government. It wasn't until after the Civil War that we started to extend those rights and those limitations on the states. And I'll explain why here in a second. So in the 14th Amendment, um, it provides in part that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That's the exact same wording as is found in the Fifth Amendment. The only difference is that the Fifth Amendment only applies to the federal government, meaning it prevents the federal government from violating a person's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, or tenth uh, amendment right. The 14th Amendment only added two words, no state. That was it. So it opened the door for what's called selective incorporation. Now pause before you have a panic attack and think, holy cow, what does this even mean? Let me break it down to you in the simplest of ways. This was developed after the Civil War. The South wasn't happy with losing. <laughs> They're still not happy, right, in some areas. Um, so when they lost and they were being told, you can't enslave anymore, you can't... Um, engage in this behavior, you can't engage in that behavior. Many states fought back and they went against federal law. That is when the 14th Amendment was put in place, prohibiting them from depriving any person from life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, have you ever had a dog that, if you were to have it around another dog, would just go crazy? So I have two dogs, one's named Tramp, one name is, the other is Banjo. I love them, but they're terrible dogs. <laughs> so I got Tramp um, during the BP oil spill. I represented the Louisiana Fishermen's Association and I didn't want to charge them. Um, and as a present, they gave me Tramp. He was one of the fishermen's dogs. And at the time I thought, oh, this is the sweetest thing. How, how could I say no? Now I'm like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> I give him away too. I'm just kidding, I love him very much. But I can't have him around any other dog because as soon as he sees another dog, he turns into like a dolphin. He makes this horrific sound, he throws himself on the ground. It's as if I'm beating him, right? So I have to be very careful when I walk him around a neighborhood because if he sees other people, he puts on a little show, he loves people. But if he sees a strange dog, he has like an epileptic fit. And so I have to have him on a leash. That is essentially what selective incorporation is. It's putting a leash on the states. 
because if they don't put a leash on the states, then under this approach, under this argument, the states would just go crazy. They would be like my dog Tramp and start biting and barking and doing crazy stuff that they're not supposed to, right? That's selective incorporation. So all of our Bill of Rights amendments have almost been selectively incorporated on the states, meaning through Supreme Court holdings, we have applied those rights and limitations to the states. There's only a couple that have not been applied to the states, and I'll point that out here in a second as to which ones those are. But now states have to respect and recognize that you have a First Amendment right to speech, religion, the right to protest. They have to respect your right to bear arms. They have to respect uh, your right against unreasonable searches and seizures, so on and so forth. That's only because of selective incorporation. Before selective incorporation came into existence, the Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government. Now you may be asking why? Why do they only apply to the federal government? Well, who were they most afraid of? They weren't afraid of the, the colonists. They were afraid of the overarching new big federal government because they didn't want another king. They didn't want another monarchy. So anything represented, representing a big power scared them. So they wanted to limit that big, massive, overarching federal power in some way. That's why the states were not a concern to them. The federal government was. It wasn't again until after the Civil War that they instituted the uh, concept of selective incorporation after the 14th Amendment, allowing these Bill of Rights to be attached, meaning leash on the states, prohibiting them from violating your First Amendment right, your Second Amendment right, your Fourth Amendment right, and so on. So, oh, okay. The First Amendment, and I want you all to look right here, consists of three things. First, it uh, addresses religion. Second, your ability to say what you want and write what you want. And third, your right to essentially protest. So religion, speech, protest. R, religion, speech, S, P, protest, R, S, P. So it's a good way to remember what does the First Amendment contain. So let's look at these three areas that the First Amendment addresses. The First Amendment prohibits Congress from making any law uh, that enforces a specific religious viewpoint. So they can't say, everybody has to follow Scientology, <laughs> right? That would be cuckoo. Um, they can't say everybody has to follow uh, Catholicism. They can't even implement a law or regulation that enforces a religious concept because they can't force us to practice a specific religious viewpoint, right? They're again, moving away from the monarchy, the King of England, which did in fact force people to follow specific religious doctrines. First it was Catholicism and then Protestantism. Protestantism. Um, so they can't force you to do that. Now, most of you have heard the concept of there's a separation between church and state. That's not in the constitution. Where that comes from, was uh, there was a letter written to uh, the president by the National Baptist Association. And this was, I believe, in the late 1700s, 1793 maybe. Anyway, when it was written, they were upset with the president because they said, why haven't you recognized our holidays? You need to recognize our holidays as national holidays and everybody has to respect them. The president was infuriated. He, one, chastised them for telling him what to do. And two, he said that there has to be a separation between church and state. There cannot be a hybrid between the two because of the establishment clause. The government can't make any law respecting an establishment of religion, which is essentially what they were asking, requiring, demanding of the president to do. And he said no. So that's where that concept of a separation between church and state comes from. The second thing that the First Amendment does is provides that no law uh, is constitutional if it prohibits somebody from exercising their religious beliefs, right? So if you have a religious belief that you have to wear um, a certain garb 
uh, then you are free to do so. If you have a religious belief that you can't eat fish on Friday um, or exercise some other religious belief, the government can't tell you you can't, okay? But there is a caveat to that. As long as it does not conflict with otherwise valid laws. So you can't be permitted to go out and murder a bunch of people because your religion tells you that you should, because that would obviously violate with valid laws. So the question is, does your free exercise conflict with anything, right? So this is a real case. This woman on the left is a part of a group called the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. If you're not familiar with them, look them up. <laughs> They're a pretty uh, fun group to kind of ex explore. If you're ever in New Orleans, they have a crew that marches during Mardi Gras and they're pretty funny. Neither here nor there. This woman uh, wanted to wear a colander on her head. Now, for those of you who are not 90 years old like me, a colander is basically a strainer, but it's metal, right? The me when you see a metal bowl with it like this with holes in it, that's a colander, it's not a strainer. Grandma on me likes to argue that point with my husband, but she wanted to wear it in the picture. And the DMV person, you can imagine, was like, uh, no, you can't wear that. And she said, I have a First Amendment right to exercise my religious belief. And yes, I can. So this case reached all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And what they ultimately ruled was that, yes, she has a First Amendment right to exercise her religious belief of placing a colander on her head because it wasn't violating other valid laws. What's the only requirement for taking a picture for your driver's license? that your face has to be visible. Her face is clearly visible. So therefore, she, her religious freedom was recognized and um, permitted under the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. Now, the second aspect of the First Amendment is that it addresses speech, right? We have the freedom of speech. Now, speech doesn't just include what you orally say. Right? So I can say, um, I don't like cedar trees because cedar trees drive my sinuses crazy, right? They should all be burned, <laughs> right? Which I don't believe that, but I, I'm not a fan of cedar. Um, we have the right to say that, right? But we also have a right to have uh, symbolic speech. So if I have a shirt that on the back says, screw cedar trees, that's symbolic speech, it's protected. It'd be kind of weird, but it's protected. So it, speech doesn't have to just be spoken. It can also be uh, in the form of a symbol, like a peace sign or some other symbol, right? Um, there was a woman that I had a case uh, ex examining, I should say, in Louisiana, in which on her roof, she put in Christmas lights, um, the ex expletive F, she actually spelled it out, um, Christmas. And it was visible to everybody who drove by. And the question was, should she be permitted to have that on her roof? And ultimately, they said, it's horrible. It's not a nice thing to say. Kids can see it, but she's permitted to have it. That's symbolic speech. She wasn't verbally saying that, but she was using those letters as a form of uh, representing what she felt. Now, government entities are entitled to regulate speech. Speech is not absolute, uh, protected absolutely, meaning you can't, you're not free to say whatever you want. Governments can regulate speech based on three things, and this is the greatest way to remember it. TPM, time, place, manner. Government can regulate what time you say things, the place you say things, and the manner in which you say things. So you're not most likely going to be permitted to run around your neighborhood at two in the morning with a bullhorn shouting, I hate city council, city council sucks. You can't most likely do that. Most likely you would have to get a permit or go to at a specific time to a specific place in the city to voice your uh, feelings, voice your opinions, voice your position, right? So again, they can regulate you based on your time, place, and manner of your speech. So there's four uh, things that are looked at to determine if the time, place, manner restrictions are permissible or is the government going too far? This is known as the O'Brien test. So the O'Brien test looks at four things. First, does it further an important or substantial government regulation? So I'll give you an example of what this would look like. Let's say next semester, the university at Texas State says, um, 
you know, we lost a lot of money on parking the last year because nobody was coming up here and buying parking passes. So let's make up some money. Now parking passes are, uh, should cost $3,200. People would go crazy. That's insane. It'd be cuckoo. So you protest. Let's say you go on Sesame and you march against that increase in parking price, right? So they tell you, look, you can't march in the middle of Sesame at noon. Why? Because they have an important interest in protecting your safety as well as driver's safety. They don't want drivers to crash into each other trying to avoid running into you, right? So second, the government interest served by the regulation is unrelated to the suppression of speech. So Texas State can't tell students, look, you can't protest because what you're complaining about, it's silly. We need to make money. They can't censor you based on the content of your speech. If their censorship or their regulation is um, in any way related to the content of your speech, then that is a no-no, that is unconstitutional, can't do that. Third, the regulation is narrowly tailored to serve the government's interests such that the restriction on free speech is not greater than is necessary to achieve the government interest. Essentially, they can't go too far. They can't say, okay, look, you can protest, but you have to protest between noon and 12.05 within this 10 by 10 square. Well, that is going way overboard, right? So that would be an example of something that's not nearly tailored and is going overboard. The fourth is it still leaves open ample alternative means for people to communicate their message. So if they wanna pass out flyers, rock on, pass out flyers. If they want to stand on the side with signs, stand on the side with signs. The, they can't prohibit you from all forms and methods of communication, right? You still have to have some way to convey your message. So not every speech has First Amendment protections. So first up, again, I wanna emphasize the government can regulate your speech based on what? TPM, time, place, manner. But they can also prohibit your speech if it is considered obscenity, fighting words or defamation. They do not have First Amendment protection, period. So an, an example of obscenity stemmed from this film. This film was being shown in a small theater in Ohio. It was a French film. And in the film, it was considered obscene, risque. And essentially it was an older woman who falls in love with a younger man and they ride off into the sunset after partying together and she leaves her family, right? That was considered obscene. And it reached all the way to the United States Supreme Court because at the time the local police shut it down. They said, shut it down. And they wouldn't let the movie uh, be seen anymore by anybody. So the owner of the uh, movie theater said, hey, I have a first amendment right to show this movie. And they said, no, you don't, because it's obscene. But the million dollar question was, was it obscene? And Justice Potter made the most famous line, probably within United States Supreme Court history, which is, they said, it's not obscene. But when they asked him, well, what is obscene? He said, I know it when I see it. Well, how do you apply that to anything else? Do we all have to go to Justice Potter to <laughs> evaluate everything that we think might be obscene? Justice Potter is not going to be a lot around forever, right? So inevitably, we had to revisit how do we determine whether or not something's obscene. And it ultimately was, came down to this case, the Miller case. It has to, it will be considered obscene if it can check mark yes to all three of these things. Number one, the work taken as a whole by an average person applying contemporary community standards appeals to the purient interest. Purient interest is a very old school way of saying like the darkest of the dark imagination, right? So pause there. Number two, the work depicts sexual conduct in a patently offensive way. And number three, the work when taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. L-A-P-S, lacks, laps. So if it's lacking and laps, literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, then it will be considered obscene. But think about how many things we could argue are artistic. Some people might consider it obscene, whereas other people may view it as beautiful. There was a congressman a few years ago, United States congressman, 
that wanted to actually, and this is true, cover up some of the statues at the White House because it showed the male form. Well, most people, when they view these statues, consider them beautiful, right? But he considered it obscene. So if you can show that it has some artistic value, then it's not going to be considered obscene. To date, the United States Supreme Court has really only focused on one category that inevitably never has protection under the First Amendment, and it's typically child pornography. Child pornography does not have First Amendment protection. There was a case a few years ago in which that um, area, that's, that type of depiction was put in a cartoon form. So they found a loophole, so to speak, and those were seen as artistic. So kind of a scary loophole, but I want you to be aware of that. All right, so that is obscenity in a nutshell. Liter lacks literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, appeals to purian interest, um, and depicts sexual conduct in a patently offensive way. Again, good way to remember, LAPS. The second category that's not protected under the First Amendment is fighting words. That's speech that because it's likely to incite immediate violence is not protected by the First Amendment. So it's speech that just by saying it will, not might, will cause imminent violence. So if I say, man, I'd like to burn this mother down, <laughs> that may be kind of crazy, but will that instantly cause you guys to jump on board and help me light the building on fire? No, hopefully not. But if I say, okay, guys, let's do this. Let's burn this mother down. That's different. I'm now instigating you to take immediate action. You see the difference? So fighting words that will, by their just very oral speech, by just saying it, will result in imminent violence. That's not protected under the First Amendment. Now, y'all are going to a state school. You have First Amendment protections. I wanna point out that the First Amendment, none of these amendments apply to private businesses or private schools. So when we look at, well, should Twitter ban so-and-so? Should Facebook have the power to ban so-and-so? Doesn't matter. They are not bound by the First Amendment. They're a private entity, okay? So the First Amendment only applies to government action, to public schools, um, state action, federal action. So here, let's say you want to engage in some speech at Texas State, you have a First Amendment right to do so. But if you went to Incarnate Word in San Antonio or Our Lady of the Lake in San Antonio, you wouldn't have a First Amendment right. They're a private university. They can tell you you have to wear blue every day and that would be okay. So the Tinker Standard said that you have the right in a state institution, a state university, to engage in speech as long as it does not materially and substantially interfere with the educational process. That's the standard. So this is a checklist for your information. It'll help you on the first exam. Uh, make sure to print it out or write it out, whatever works best for you. So let's look at some examples. Do you think this group is protected or not? This is a real group. They're known as the Westboro Baptist. They are infamous for going to veterans funerals um, and protesting. And they have signs like this, right? Not the kind of people you'd wanna hang out with. <laughs> but the million dollar question is, do they have a first amendment right to do this? Sadly, yes. Um, again, you can't prohibit speech unless it constitutes obscenity, fighting words, defamation or libel, which by the way, defamation and libel is just basically when you write something or say something that can be proven as false, right? That's just materially false. So if you say, Professor Shaw does crap, that would be defamation, don't say that, right? Or if you write it, that would be libel, same thing. But here, you this is not obscene, they're not depicting something in a patently sexually offensive way. Um, and you could argue that they have literary, artistic, political, or maybe even scientific value in what they're saying. So the only thing that you could really look at and argue is do they have, it, could this be constituted as fighting words? Now, some people have argued, well, by saying this, they're causing people to want to fight them. Maybe, but most of the time, have you, if you've seen the videos, what do people mostly do when they see these individuals? They shake their head. Some people try to reason with them, but most of the time people just walk by. 
So this is, does not constitute fighting words. The United States Supreme Court has uh, found that they have a First Amendment right to say such things in such circumstances. The only thing that can be done is the government can regulate their speech based on the time, the place, and the manner. Now, what about this? I like these kids, they make me giggle. So these high school students left their class and they put up this sign. This case reached the United States Supreme Court. Do you think they have a First Amendment right to do this? It wasn't a private school. The answer is no. Why? Your speech can't materially or substantially interfere with the educational process. Number one, they left class to do this. Number two, what does their sign advocate? Criminal activity. This is in Colorado. <laughs> this is in California. In many states, it's still illegal. So the United States Supreme Court said that, that speech was not protected. And last but not least, Facebook. Can you say what you want, when you want, how you want on Facebook? No, because they're a private business. They don't have to follow. They're not limited um, by the First Amendment. You don't have a First Amendment right to say what you want on Facebook or Twitter or any other social media because those are private companies. They are not bound by the Bill of Rights. Okay, so that's a mistake that happens time and time again. I yell at my TV like a crazy old person when they do that because um, it's a private entity. They can do what they want. All right. Now, I'm not going to go too far into the Second Amendment because it's not a big um, corner of this class. But of course, I want you to be uh, cognizant of the case law that applies to it. So I put these two cases up here and um, you're welcome to YouTube them. There's tons of documentation, tons of scholarly research done on these cases. But in essence, know that the government can regulate uh, ownership, gun ownership. They can regulate it, but they can't prevent it, prohibit it completely. Okay, that's the crux. The Third Amendment. Now, remember in the first video when I mentioned the intolerable acts uh, that the king put in place when he sent the soldiers, uh, the guards, down to the 13 colonies and prohibited any importation or exportation of goods? Well, at that time, the other thing that he allowed to have happen is those guards were allowed to take over the hotels, um, the inns, so to speak, take over people's houses, eat their food, basically take over their property. The Third Amendment prohibits that. So you could argue that it's the least used amendment because I don't think, I don't think any of you are scared that the National Guard is going to come and take over your house, <laughs> right? So um, typically that's not something we're really concerned with anymore, but just know that that's why it's there. Now the Fourth Amendment, this is the bulk of this course. The bulk of this course stems from the Fourth Amendment, which protects our, us, you and me, everybody, from unreasonable searches and seizures. Now, this stems from um, our experience with the monarchy and with Britain, in which they issued general warrants, which allowed um, individuals with law enforcement capabilities to enter your home, to search your person, to question you, to keep you for however long, whenever, wherever they wanted. We no longer wanted to experience that. So that's why the Fourth Amendment was put in place by the Founding Fathers. The Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment guarantees quite a few things, but I wanna focus on the first one first. We touched on the concept of selective incorporation, which remember is like a leash that the federal government puts on the states, preventing them from acting crazy, acting like my dog Tramp. So um, the only right within the Fifth Amendment that has not been selectively incorporated is the concept of the grand jury. States do not have to have a grand jury. So for instance, does Texas have a grand jury system? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Uh-huh, we do. Other states don't and they don't have to. So some states have it, some states don't. Now, the second concept founded within the Fifth Amendment is the right to remain silent. Specifically, you don't have the duty, you don't have the responsibility to help the state make their case against you, okay? The burden is on the state to prove that you're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. You don't have to, and you shouldn't, open your mouth to say anything. Stay silent, you have that right to remain silent. Now, some people say, well, I have nothing to hide. 
you don't know that. You may say something that incriminates you and you don't even realize it, right? Um, the other concept is double jeopardy. So the government only gets one swing of the bat to prove that you're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If you're acquitted, if you're found not guilty, then they can't go after you again for the same crime, period, the end, can't do that. Um, the other concept founded within the United States Constitution's Fifth Amendment is the Due Process Clause. Now remember, the Fifth Amendment only applies the concept of due process to the federal government. These amendments did not apply to the states until what amendment? The 14th. So it says you have the right um, to your life, liberty, and property through due processes of law, meaning the government can't take away your life, your liberty, or your property without due process of law. Now, as a quick um, explanation, you hear that term a lot, due process, and nobody ever really explains it, I don't think. They don't really explain it in textbooks. It's used and thrown around in every lecture within CJ. So I wanna save you uh, about $40,000 worth of a law school education for your first year, because <laughs> you still have to pay a lot more after that. But essentially what due process, says, due process is, is two things. Your right to know why you're in trouble, so notice, and your opportunity to be heard, to defend yourself. So you have to know why you're in trouble and you have to have an opportunity to defend yourself, i.e. in a trial, before the government can take away your life, your liberty, or your property. That's all that due process is. Now, throughout the rest of this term, you will not hear me give my personal opinion. I always say it's not the law according to Shaw, it's the law according to the United States Supreme Court. There's only one time, uh, maybe two, that I'll give my personal opinion, but you're welcome to disagree with me. I welcome disagreement, that's not a bad thing. And that's with a recent United States Supreme Court decision uh, regarding just compensation. So the Fifth Amendment prohibits the government from taking away your personal property um, for public use unless they provide just compensation, right? So usually this allows the government to take away uh, your property if they need to build an interstate or uh, provide some type of access to a waterway, something of that sort. Now, in a case called Kilo versus City of New London, this house came under scrutiny. A little old lady, Mrs. Kilo, um, her husband built this house for them when they had gotten married. She lived in it for over 70 years. She lived in this community when a pharmaceutical company had come in, not the government, a private company had come in and they wanted to tear down this entire neighborhood in order to build a pharmaceutical complex, right? A new business uh, venture. For this specific area, they were thinking more parking lots, okay? So they need parking lots for their new employees. So the way they pitch this to the city of New London is, hey, when we come, we'll, we'll hire tons of your people. It'll bring up tax revenue for your community. We will have a benefit to, to provide you, right? So they ultimately ruled against Ms. Kilo allowed the pharmaceutical company to have a domain over her property, tore down the house, and now the government can take land for private use as long as there's a public benefit. Now I wanna point out something. That's what it looks like now. The pharmaceutical company never came through, the business venture completely failed, and now it's just an empty lot where an entire community once was. The state Supreme Court justice that ruled on that decision, as well as the United States Supreme Court justice, convey that they felt terrible about their decision, and they actually have a quote, which is now on a marker where her house once stood, saying that it was the worst decision that they'd ever made. So time will tell whether or not the Supreme Court um, retracts that decision. It'll be interesting, but that is the one time that I will give my personal opinion, and I think that is just pooey, awful, not my favorite decision. Okay, um, Sixth Amendment guarantees. So you have the right to a speedy and public trial. Now, whoops, typically speedy means that the red flags will start to raise after one year. So if you haven't had a trial within one year of being arrested and charged, then the red flags start to raise and there might be a Sixth Amendment violation. That doesn't mean an automatic violation, that means you might have a violation of your Sixth Amendment. When I say might, 
the government can stay a uh, good cause for having delayed your trial. So an example of good cause is during Hurricane Katrina. When Hurricane Katrina occurred, they lost all their records. The courthouse was a mess. And um, as a result, many of the people that were waiting in jail for a trial had their trials pushed back to even three years. And um, the courts ultimately ruled that was not a Sixth Amendment violation because they had to delay it for a good cause. You also have the right to a trial by an impartial jury. Um, whoop, impartial jury. So that means uh, a re representation of your peers within your community will ultimately be picked by the attorneys during the process of voir dire. And essentially they're supposed to view your case as an impartial individual. They're not supposed to convey any type of prejudice um, on the defendant without hearing the evidence presented at trial. Now, Sandra Day O'Connor once said that it is unrealistic to think that a juror walks into the Supreme Court or walks into the courthouse doors void of any life experience or any prejudice. And I think she's right. But where it comes into question is if that person has such deeply rooted bias that it would skew their ability to view the evidence in an impartial manner. Right, so that's where the, the fine line is. You also have the right to notice of your charges. You can't be vague. So in Florida, this was actually a real ordinance. There was a community in Florida, of course it's Florida. They always have crazy stuff happen in which they banned annoying behavior. Well, what does that mean, right? What is annoying behavior? What one person considers annoying, another person might consider completely fine. So that's not uh, specific enough in order to give people notice of a behavior that's prohibited in a community. So that would be a Sixth Amendment violation if they arrested somebody for annoying behavior. You also have the right to confront your witnesses um, through face-to-face -face witness testimony. So if somebody's gonna accuse you of something, you have the right to question them, period, the end. Hearsay is prohibited. So typically when I have in-person classes, I make everybody do what's called a phone exercise. So in middle school and elementary, this used to be a really common game. I don't know if you've ever played it, but try this amongst a group of your friends. Whisper something in somebody's ear, very detailed. Say for instance, on May 18th, 2021, Professor Shaw said blue, red, yellow, green, and then she passed out a bunch of cigarettes. Crazy, right? then that person tells another person what they heard. And that person tells another person what they heard. And let's say it goes through five, six, seven, eight, nine different people. Do you think that ninth person is going to convey the message properly? Heck no, nope, nope, nope. That's why hearsay is prohibited. Hearsay is when you're getting uh, testimony from somebody who did not directly hear it from the source. They heard it from their brothers, cousins, uncles, neighbors, dog, right? No, no, can't do that. And then we have the right to compel people to testify. Nobody is excited to go to court. I've never met anybody that's like, woo, I get to testify. <laughs> so that is why the Sixth Amendment allows us to force people to testify. All right, and you have the right to representation through an attorney, right? For all prosecutions that may result in imprisonment. So if you're being sued for a contract dispute, you're not going to go to prison. You're going to pay money. So you can't get a court appointed attorney. But if you're going, you're facing charges that may result in jail time or prison time, then you can get an attorney. This stems from Powell versus Alabama and 1932 case in which there were three one day trials in which they found all these young boys uh, guilty of rape um, and 10 years imprisonment. And some were even sentenced to death. The juries found the defendants guilty and imposed the death penalty upon all. Only one of the 13 year olds uh, escaped such a sentence. And it was found out that the attorney that originally helped them hadn't even read their case. And then years and years later, the women who claimed rape came forward and said it was false. It was a lie, right? So when this reached the Supreme Court, they said that, no, this is not getting your right to counsel under the Sixth Amendment. Um, that this was just a shadow. This was an echo of representation, meaning it was fake representation. That's not real representation. So I wanna point something out. Today, you have the right to an attorney 
if you're facing charges that may result in imprisonment, but you're not afforded a GERD attorney. You may have the cruddiest of cruddy attorneys. Um, so the Sixth Amendment guarantees you representation, but it doesn't guarantee you good representation. I just wanna point that out. So the Seventh Amendment is broken into two parts. The first is federal civil cases have the right to a jury. This applies only to federal civil trials and not to civil suits in state courts, okay? Two, you cannot review facts decided by juries in lower courts. Now pause, I have this issue every semester. Trial court finds Bob guilty of committing robbery and shooting somebody in the head, right? So he's sentenced to prison. He appeals that decision. The appellate court cannot say, you know what? I don't think he shot that person at 10 o'clock. I think maybe he shot them at seven o'clock and um, he didn't steal a hundred dollars. He stole 50. They can't question the facts that have already been determined by the jury. What they can say is that the law wasn't properly applied to his case based on the facts. So the trial jury determines the facts the appellate court, and let's say the Supreme Court, only determines whether or not the law was applied properly to those facts. So the juries are the fact finder and the judge determines the law's application. That's it. So the Eighth Amendment, you cannot have excessive bail applied to you, meaning you don't have the right to bail. Bail is not a right. It is a considered a privilege if you're afforded bail. But if it is granted, it can't be excessive. And typically the way that's determined if it is, and I love this, if it's reasonably calculated in light of the perceived evil. So if you stole a Twinkie, it would be unreasonable for the judge to set a bail amount of a million dollars. That would be cuckoo. But if you went around and killed a bunch of puppies around an entire community and they put a bail amount of let's say $100,000, that's reasonable in light of perceived evil. You don't want a puppy killer running around. Um, so again, you're not guaranteed bail, but if you are afforded bail, it has to be reasonable. Reasonable in light of the calculated uh, perceived evil. You also have freedom from cruel and unusual punishment. So words matter. And I want you to notice something. Here, it doesn't say cruel or unusual. It says cruel and unusual. So let me give you an example of why words matter. If I told you you had the choice of having coffee and a million dollars or coffee or a million dollars, which choice set would you go for? The first, coffee and a million dollars, not coffee or a million dollars because then you just have one or the other. Um, so here it has to be considered cruel and unusual. So you can be cruel, uh, but not unusual. And you can be unusual, but not cruel, right? It has to be both. So to determine if it's both, um, you first have to ask whether it's degrading. Is the punishment put in place just to simply humiliate or torture the person? Two, it cannot be arbitrary, meaning you're just winging it. You're telling the person that they have to run around 10 times in a tutu and then lock them up um, face down in a jail cell eight hours a day, that would be degrading and arbitrary. And then three, it has to be completely rejected by society. Now this is where um, the death penalty always faces its biggest confrontation is the question is, has it been completely rejected by society? The answer is no. Um, some states have it, some states don't. So it hasn't been across the board considered a uh, cruel and unusual punishment yet. Time will tell. All right, the Ninth Amendment. Now, the Ninth Amendment basically takes into account that the founding fathers weren't fortune tellers. They couldn't foresee every single situation that might arise. And they knew that. They knew that they were not putting in everything that possibly they might or should or could within the United States Constitution Bill of Rights. So basically they said, um, just because it's not in the Constitution specifically doesn't mean that the right doesn't exist, okay? So I'll give you an example of what that mean, looks like. If you were in high school and your parents or legal guardians went on a trip and they gave you a list of everything you couldn't do, like no parties, no guests after 10, 
um, probably in your teenage head, you were like, well, hey, they didn't say I couldn't have people over at 10.04 drinking. <laughs> they didn't write that one down. So you thought you're being really cool and smart by doing that. And if you got in trouble, say, well, you didn't say I couldn't do it. That's essentially what the founding fathers are saying is just because it's not written down doesn't mean that it's still not considered a right. So things like birth control, uh, right to marriage, right to education are things that are considered rights despite the fact it's not provided for within the Bill of Rights. Now the 14th Amendment again has the right to due process that's now applied to the states um, and provides equal protection of the laws. We're not going to go too far into that in this class, but it is a fascinating uh, amendment to look for. It could be a class in and of itself. And then the 10th Amendment is for all those Federalists out there. Um, those of you who like Ron Paul will love this amendment. Um, it's basically saying that any right that's not afforded to the federal government is reserved to the states, right? So uh, the DMV, for instance, is not a right that the federal government runs, that's a state right, right? We run, Texas has a DMV, right? Department of Motor Vehicles. So that gives the rights that are not given to the federal government to the states. And that's all guys. Um, that is the end of week one. I hope you all enjoy this first week. I promise future weeks are not gonna be as long in terms of lectures. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Otherwise you guys are ready to rock and roll. And um, I also included a study guide for this first week. I like to do that just to kind of keep your wheels turning and preparing for the assessments which are coming up because it's a short semester. All right, bye guys. <laughs>